Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. I, as always, am your host, Simon Wimmer's here in this case. Wimmer's here, one of my writers. Thank you, Matt, has written me a script. Elizabeth Wettlaufer, Canada's most prolific killer nurse. Why are there so many medical professionals killing people? Like, I swear we've had, like, Shipman. We had that other dude. Then we had the, the, the woman nurse in the UK. Why? If you're going to medicine, you should be wanting to save people, not just kill them. The fuck? <laughs> The format of the show, if you're new here, I've never read this before, we're going to read it and explore it together, dear listener. Let us jump in. It was a cool autumn afternoon in late September of 2016 when 49 year old Elizabeth May Wettlaufer, a patient of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, Ontario, was picked up by police for questioning. After being transported to the local station, she was placed inside an interview room and told to make herself comfortable while investigators looked over the details in her file. According to their notes, Elizabeth, who often went by Beth or Bethy, oh yeah! <laughs> I always just assumed that Beth or Bethy was always just short for Bethany. But I guess it could also be Elizabeth as well. Fascinating Whoa. fact there. Brain expanded. That's why you're here. Well, she checked herself into CAM. C-A-M? Center for Addiction and Mental Health? Okay. Less than a week earlier to seek treatment for opioid addiction. However, while being evaluated, she admitted to something very disturbing. While working as a nurse in various elder care facilities around Ontario, Beth claimed that she had murdered at least eight separate people under her care and attempted to murder many more. Oh my god, Beth, what are you doing? Don't admit to your crimes. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I listen, I'm checking in because I'm really addicted to opiates and I need to get clean. Also, just FYI, I've killed many people. What are you up to? Why would you say that? Initially, Beth's counsellors had not believed her because she had a long history of lying with her attention, but because of the serious nature of her claims, they wanted to be sure before dismissing them outright. Good. You can imagine this starts off with, and they completely ignored her, thinking she was an attention seeker, and then she went on to kill 30 more people. No, good counsellors, good job. They had instructed her to write down her crimes while providing as many details as possible, and a day later, Beth had given them a four-page confession detailing who, when, where, and how she had killed them. This confession was so thorough that her counselors had been immediately stirred to action, which had prompted them to contact the authorities without delay. Good. <laughs> If there was any other cause of action, I'd be very surprised. And I suppose, like, one of the rules on Casual Criminalist... For anyone new who's listening, I think rule number one is like, don't write down your crimes. Unless, I mean, obviously she's like, this is it. End of the road. I'm confessing to all my crimes for whatever reason. In that case, go right ahead. You know, the best gifts aren't just about the item inside. It's about the thought and emotion behind that gift. Look, imagine being able to give that to someone else. And that's where today's sponsor, Holzkern, comes in. This incredible brand, founded in Austria, creates unique natural products with a story. Each piece is like a fingerprint. It's one of a kind. And what's amazing is they started as a small family business and they've grown into a global phenomenon. Their collection is massive. They've got watches, one of which I'm wearing right now. They've got jewelry, they've got sunglasses, they've got handbags, you name it. And with a diverse range of over a thousand designs, there is something for everyone. Plus a million happy customers. So they're obviously doing something right. Holzkern is offering an exclusive 15% discount on all products. All you need to do is go to holzkern.com forward slash the casual criminalist and use the promo code casual15. The link's in the description and the pinned comment below. Plus, Hoss can guarantee delivery before Christmas if you place it up to the 20th of December. So if you're super last minute, they'll sort you out. Plus, they've got gift bags and boxes if you don't want to wrap up the gift and postcards for personal notes as well. Make this holiday season unforgettable with Holzgern because every gift should tell a story. Holzgern.com slash casual criminalist. Promo code casual15 for 15% off. And now back to today's video. Although she may have violated the first rule that we all know so well at this point, indeed, Beth wasn't stupid. She knew this letter would seal her fate by ensuring the rest of her life would be spent behind bars, but she didn't care. For years, she'd tried to stop killing on her own, but simply could not. She was ready to die in prison to prevent anyone else from dying by her hands. Now, as officers observed Beth covertly through the interview room's camera system, they tried to determine for themselves if the woman before them could possibly be capable of killing anyone. She was short, heavy set and appeared harmless. But if what she claimed in her letter was true, she was also one of Canada's most prolific serial killers. Unfortunately for many of her victims, it was all completely true. The Devout Family Elizabeth May Wettlaufer, whose maiden name was Elizabeth Parker, was born in Woodstock, Ontario, on the 10th of June 1967 to parents Doug and Hazel Parker. 
As a child, Beth's home life can best be described as unhealthy, as while she was not physically abused, she was made to feel very small and insignificant and told that children needed to be seen, not heard. Well, I mean, it was the 1960s and 70s. I've seen Mad Men. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you and everyone else, Elizabeth. Doug and Hazel's decision to raise their children in this manner stemmed from one very important fact that is essential to our understanding who the Parkers were and how their family functioned. Doug and Hazel were both fervent Christians who believed wholeheartedly in the teachings of the Bible. I mean, again, it was the 1970s. You and everyone else, Elizabeth. Doug was even an elder at their family's church and he taught Beth and her siblings to follow the church's teachings without question. As you shall soon see, this left Beth with more than a few issues stemming from some good old-fashioned religious trauma. While attending elementary school, Beth wasn't able to find friends among the other children in her class, all of whom thought she was odd. They described her as shy and awkward, which made her the target of relentless bullying. Those bullies mocked the way she spoke, the way she walked, the way she talked, and everything else she did or tried to do. This destroyed her self-esteem in the process. Again, like, none of this is... Okay, so she was brought up, seen, not heard. She was in a devoutly religious family. She was bullied at school. Okay, so, like, almost everybody at some point. I mean, other than the, like, devout religious thing. Oh, like, there's a, there's a large percentage of people who had this. It's not like... Even when a serial killer has a horrible background to this oh yeah they were fully abused by everyone in their family and friends and extended like everyone who ever met them abused them i'm still i'm still like it's not an excuse and it's like okay beth so your your upbringing was just not great <laughs> When Beth was in middle school, she was miserable, but upon entering high school, her fortune began to change when she joined the school's field hockey team. Here she found the purpose and friendship among a group of people who were all fighting for a common goal. She then joined the school's band, and her small pool of friends grew once again. I had no idea what field hockey was for the longest time, and then I found out it's just what I call hockey. Like, at school, we'd play hockey. And then I found out that everyone else in the world outside of the uk apparently thinks that hockey refers to ice hockey and i'm always like what that's ice hockey hockey is what you play on like an astroturf with a wooden stick and apparently that's field hockey so there we go and i was like oh that's weird what's this field hockey thing fascinating tangent simon thank you carry on she then joined the school's band and her small pool of friends began to grow once again. Overall, Beth's time in high school proved to be a vast improvement over her middle school years. However, these good times would not last. Around this point in her life, Beth began to notice that she felt more attracted to the girls in her class than the boys. At first, she thought this attraction was just admiration and her desire to be like those girls. But as she progressed through puberty and her thoughts turned sexual in nature, she began to realize, to her own horror, that she was a lesbian. For Beth, a teen living in an extremely religious household in the 1980s, this was a nightmare scenario. She had seen how gays and lesbians had been treated within her church and community by her own family, and feared that if word of her own sexual orientation spread, she would be excommunicated by the church and kicked out of her home. And this is, like, really rough. I'm glad, like, my parents are very progressive. If it turns out that I was gay, they'd just be like, cool. Like, I can imagine them not even having a reaction. They'd be like, oh, that's brave of you to tell us. Well, that's, you know, I mean, because it was a little bit back in the day. But that would be that would have been it. There is no possible other reaction I could possibly imagine from them. And I think that's really cool. And the past was the worst. And I'm glad that it's just getting easier for people to do that. Because, like, <laughs> I don't know, this whole thing about, oh, no, it's a choice. It's like, are you insane? It's obviously not a choice. It's like, you, if you just ask like me, do you, is you liking women a choice? It's like, no, I just like women. It's the same thing for gay people. It's not that complicated, is it, world? I think like 99% of people get that now. Just some old people don't. But they will. And they're probably gay themselves. Determined not to let that happen, Beth attempted to hide her sexual desires. However, the power of teenage hormones is strong, and a neighborhood girl quickly caught her attention. After working up the courage, Beth admitted her attraction to this girl, but her confession did not yield the result she was hoping for. Beth was aggressively rejected, mocked by the girl, and sent home crying. Even worse, it didn't take Beth's father long to learn of what she'd done from other members of their community. Uh-oh. I feel like if you, I don't know, like not being gay, I'd be like, I don't know. I'd like be pretty sure if I was going to do that, especially as a kid, you'd be like, better make sure that person's gay first. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not going to go well. I realize I don't know how this works. Is that ignorant? Did I? I I'm always like, am I going to say something offensive? <laughs> I don't. I'm not intending to be. 
Now, while it's not known what consequences befell Beth following this slip-up, one thing we do know is that after being outed to her father, Beth began fiercely suppressing her true sexual desires. From this point onward, at least until the end of high school, she stopped pursuing the girls she was attracted to in favor of pursuing the boys that she was most certainly not attracted to in order to keep up appearances. These boys, who thought she was strange, were not attracted to her either, which made the whole situation an all-round nightmare for everyone involved. Wait, wait, wait. Wouldn't that make it better? She's like, no, no, I like boys. It's just a real shame the boys don't like me. I mean, oh no. <laughs> In college, Beth originally wanted to study journalism, and she did so for a single semester. However, she eventually shifted her focus to something closer to home. Because she'd always felt so rejected by the church, but still desperately wanted to be a part of it, she decided to become a spiritual counselor in order to aid children and teens like herself by helping them find purpose within the church. Really? Really? The church is so like... Apparently, this church, at least I know a lot of churches... Are like so against what you are and your parents and all this stuff have just been like yeah no we're not into that at all that's bad times um i'm really surprised she's like yeah, yeah i'm gonna lean into that church thing okay beth was still fully rejecting her sexuality at this time so she enrolled in london baptist bible college in london ontario in the hopes that diving deeper into her religion would allow her to overcome the thoughts and desires that she'd been told are terribly sinful this didn't work. While attending LBBC, Beth's father, Doug, enrolled in classes alongside her. Uh-oh. <laughs> what are you doing, Doug? Get out of your kid's life. Like, that's weird. That's really weird. Like, now I've got kids, I imagine my kids going out. It's like, no, 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 I'm going to come to school with you. They'd be like, Dad, fuck off, please. Please, Dad. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be cool, Dad. And you're not cool. And I'd be like, oh, that's sad. But I totally get it and don't do it because it was weird. He claimed to be taking courses on religion in hopes of becoming a pastor, although as many have speculated, he was just as likely keeping tabs on Beth to ensure that she was staying on the straight and narrow, with emphasis on straight. This was likely because Beth had been spotted sinning yet again, and sinning like this. Sinning. <laughs> During Beth's early years at LBBC, she had attempted to pursue a lesbian relationship with one of her classmates, but was kicked out of college when another student reported the pair for attending a gay-friendly church together. Is lesbian still the word? Like, I feel people use the word gay for men and women now. What's the right thing? Is that is lesbian still like okay? I don't know. I just never don't hear it as much anymore. I was just here gay. What am I supposed to use? Let me know in the comments and I'll improve myself. Beth was only allowed to re-enroll at LBBC after her father forced her to undergo what the church called a conversion and reparative therapy. Yeah, that's going to work, isn't it? <laughs> Let's pray the gay away! This would not be the last time Beth would be admitted into one of these types of programs. I didn't work. She's still gay. Let's try again and again. Oh, shit. Here we go again. After completing the course, Beth returned to LBBC and apologized for her behavior to the girls' college administration. She told them that she had sinned, it had been a mistake, and it would never happen again. She asked them to pray for her, to pray that she would follow the Lord's plan for her. Pray that guy away! Around this time in her life, Beth's few friends said that she was unsurprisingly a very sad person. Quote, She lived with a lot of depression, a lot of self-loathing, and self-doubt. Oh, I wonder why. I'm immediately like, I know, I was like, obviously she turns out to be the killer like a multi-murderer in today's episode but it's like other like i was like oh no poor beth she got bullied in school oh no poor beth her parents were religious now i'm like yeah this would really suck but still it's not an excuse for killing people this inner conflict left beth searching for an outlet but she was unable to find one as a known sinner on campus she was watched very closely and even after graduating and receiving her degree in spiritual counseling her father continued to keep close tabs on her one important thing to note about Beth during this time in her life is that, although she wouldn't receive an official diagnosis until much later, she began to exhibit symptoms of borderline personality disorder, and those symptoms may have been present as far back as high school. She had an intense fear of abandonment and loneliness, trouble maintaining relationships, impulse control issues, a poor self-image, erratic moods, sudden bursts of anger, and many more well-known and well-documented issues. Had she received professional help, it's possible that her life may have taken a completely different and less tragic route, but we will, unfortunately, never know. Isn't borderline personality bpd one of those things that isn't necessarily super helped by counseling i thought that was one of those ones where it's like this isn't actually it doesn't help for some reason i don't remember why i just vaguely remember that let me know after returning home from college, Beth attempted to find a job working as a counselor, but quickly realized that she'd made a huge mistake. The inner turmoil and mental health issues she faced on a daily basis made her a terrible counselor, and she quickly decided that she had chosen, or been forced into, the wrong career. Unsure of what to do next, she then quit her job and enrolled at another college, Conestoga College in Stratford, Ontario, where she earned her nursing degree in three short 
and relatively uneventful years. On the job. Upon receiving her degree in nursing in 1995, Beth removed her graduation cap for the final time, donned a pair of scrubs, and re-entered the workforce, taking various jobs at hospitals around Ontario, where she did everything from fluff pillows to administer life-saving antibiotics. Just as she had suspected, this style of work suited her far better than religious counseling, because all she had ever wanted to do in life was help people, and nursing gave her that opportunity. Oh my god, when is this? Why do you get into nursing? I just want to help people. How do you end up as a killer nurse? Oh my lord. In this role, she found purpose. However, not everything about the job was perfect. Not everything about any job is perfect. I was just having a big, not not argument, but discussion <laughs> with somebody who works for me this morning. <laughs> and that's something, and I'm like, this isn't making me happy. <laughs> no job is perfect. According to Beth, she was hired as a nurse for the first time at a large hospital far outside Woodstock, but she quickly resigned after realizing that living so far away from home was making her miserable. Her second job was at a smaller local hospital, but this one also didn't work out because Beth felt that the hospital's staff members were unwelcoming to newcomers. Her third job was at another even smaller hospital, but she found it equally unfit for similar reasons. Or so she claims. Unfortunately, Beth is the only source of information we have for this time in her life, and she's an unreliable narrator. She claims that the reason she kept hopping from job to job was because she never found a place to fit in. However, there was likely another reason that nobody knew about at the time. In 1997, Beth married Donnie Wetlaufer, a truck driver she had met at church years earlier. Together, they moved into a tiny home along Woodstock's Main Street and attempted to start a life together. However, even with Donnie by her side and working a job she loved, Beth was still unhappy because she was living a lie. Yeah. Yeah. We know she likes girls. Like, this isn't going to work out. Despite what her parents, family, and friends believed about her, Beth was still very much a lesbian because the conversion therapy had, of course, not worked, and being married to a man was making Beth miserable. Her life continued to be plagued by struggle, self-doubt, anger, and confusion. As a result of this situation, Beth developed a severe drinking problem, which many have speculated may be the real reason she couldn't hold down a permanent job. Oh, I see. That's sad. She was found passed out while on the clock on more than one occasion because alcohol was the only thing capable of numbing the pain and keeping the bad thoughts away. Oh my god. I realize that that is like what alcoholism is, right? I'm always like, oh yeah, alcoholism, it's just drinking too much. And it's like, no, 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 it can be really bad. Like, she's drinking so much she's passing out at work. That's... How does someone not notice that? Like, you can smell alcohol on people, no? Like, if, if it's like, if I go to bed next to my wife and i haven't drunk that evening and she's had like a glass of wine or two i'll be able to smell that if you're pass out drunk in a hospital someone's gonna be like are you drunk right now right it smells and it smells bad it's like when you're on the you know public transport or whatever and there's some dude who's clearly had a rough night and he's like heading home and you're heading to work and you're like I can literally smell the alcohol sweating off you from here, mate. And the guy's just like, ah, oh, ah, oh. <laughs> like, I'm so happy that I went to bed early last night because I have been in your position and I don't like it. You know, sometimes you're so hungover that you just know you're not going to feel good until like the middle of the afternoon. You're like, ah, oh, why? <laughs> why do I do this? When this stopped working, she then also began stealing opioids from the many hospitals she worked at. Because hospitals typically keep track of their opioid supply for this very reason, it didn't take long for Beth's supervised to recognize what she was doing, so she was eventually fired yet again, and her nursing license was suspended. At this time, Beth found herself at one of the lowest points in her life. She checked herself into a drug rehabilitation facility at her husband's request to get clean, but her sobriety did not last. She continued to return to drugs and alcohol over the following years to numb the pain, but the bad thoughts would not stop. By the mid-2000s, Beth began connecting and chatting with women on a lesbian dating site, and one of those women was named Sheila Andrews. Sheila was a prison cafeteria worker in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan? Maybe? Saskatchewan? Saskatchewan? Canada. And the pair quickly struck up a fiery digital romance. It's unclear what Beth's end goal for this relationship was, whether she wanted to keep it a secret forever or eventually reveal it to Donnie, but her intention doesn't really matter because it didn't take long for her affair to be revealed. In 2007, Donnie, who was completely oblivious to the fact that Beth was a lesbian, discovered the letters between his wife and Sheila saved in a hidden folder on their computer. Shocked, he confronted her, and when she was unable to provide a satisfactory explanation, he left. From this point on, they were officially separated, and Donnie filed for divorce a year later. Honestly, that sounds better for all parties. Like, he's not going to be happy, she's not going to be happy. It's just time. It was never time in the beginning, in the first place. But I understand what happened. But now it's like, okay, kind of good, definitely good. 
Interestingly, even after the divorce was finalized, Beth kept Wetlafer as her last name, continuing to go by it to this day. In the weeks and months that followed, Beth's life changed dramatically. No longer being supported by Donnie, she was forced to find full-time employment to keep herself afloat. By now, the suspension on her nursing license had been lifted, so she once again sought out a job in healthcare. This time, however, she applied to work at a long-term elder care facility in Woodstock, Ontario, called Carescent Care. So, I understand now that she's become addicted to alcohol and drugs, but one of the main reasons why she was struggling so much was because she was in a, a marriage where she was where she was married to a man. So isn't that going to alleviate some of the cause of this? So if she got treated, then it would be easier to get clean? One would hope. For those of you who are unaware, jobs at elder care facilities are typically not regarded as pleasant jobs. No, no, because there's, yeah, old people have, like, I don't know, it's scary to get old, right? I'm only like in my 30s and already like, oh man, getting old and then you're going, someone's going to wipe your bottom for you. It's like, oh no, not again. <laughs> like when I was a kid, you're like, I've got kids now. And it's like, now, now fortunately they're using the potty. I still got to wipe their bottoms. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> kids, and, k- babies and old people. They pay little, they require long and unusual hours and are generally thankless. However, Beth immediately fell in love with the job because it allowed her to be around and provide comfort to people who were living through their final days on earth. And she was good at it. With no family at home, Beth volunteered to work the night shift, which meant that much of her job consisted of distributing medicine, helping residents in and out of bed to use the restroom, and making sure no one wandered out of the building unsupervised. It was a relatively easy job, and Beth, who had graduated from standard alcoholic to functioning alcoholic, was placed in charge of the entire floor. This gave her a massive boost in confidence, however, it also left the door wide open for her to fall back into her old habits. As the person in charge of the facility at night, Beth was responsible for distributing pain medicine to Carescent Care's aging residents. But, as you have probably already guessed, she didn't do this. She used the increased trust afforded to her to begin stealing and taking those pills herself in order to get high during her shift. Look, I'm sorry, this isn't entirely her fault. If someone got their medical license suspended because they were stealing pills and taking pills and were a known drug addict, and you, pr- you sh- they should not be in a position where they can do that. I'm not saying she can't be the manager or whatever, but they need to carefully keep an eye on her because she's in recovery or whatever. Because that's like putting an alcohol alcoholic in like a brewery. What are you doing? This was the same thing she'd done for years before, which had resulted in her being fired and losing her license. However, this time, Beth had grown smarter. She used a variety of tactics to conceal her habits and avoid raising suspicion. For the patients that were barely lucid, she would swap their pain pills with sugar pills or gentle laxatives or any other benign medication. And for those that were more vigilant, she would often pull open the capsules, emptying their contents directly into her mouth before refilling them with another substance. Once the pills began to take effect and there was downtime, Beth would then slip down to the facility's basement away from the patients and other nurses to enjoy her high. Sometimes she would read books or magazines, but other times she'd simply close her eyes and doze off. These were the nights which Beth loved the most because the narcotics put her mind at ease and allowed her to finally relax. But as happy as she was while high, her mental state was continuing to deteriorate, and she was about to begin doing something that would horrify her co-workers if they only knew about it. The first of many. A woman named Clotilda Adriano was Beth's first official victim. She was an 88-year-old woman living at Carescent Care who suffered from advanced dementia and often forgot who and where she was. Oh my god, getting old is terrifying. Like my my nan had dementia. And it's scary and sad. Like, I still remember it. It'll stay with me forever. I just remember being at my uncle's house, who my, my grandma was living with. And I, I, I hadn't seen her in a couple of months, and I just come back. I'm just sitting down, talking to her, and she's like sort of lucid. And then she just says to me, Mark, dear, calling me my dad's name, who's that man out on the patio? And I'm like, well, that's Mark. That's Mark. I'm Simon. And she's like, oh, yes, quite right. And I'm like, it was so weird. And I'm like, oh, I see. I see. You're not there anymore. Yeah. And then it went downhill so fast. It was really, it's really sad. It's such a scary disease. Oh, now I'm sad. One night while Beth was on duty, she entered Clotilda's room to administer the woman's daily insulin dose. She took the cap off and prepared to inject the needle, but before she did, Beth took a long look at the woman, where she lay, and had a realization. Clotilda was in considerable pain, both mental and physical. She was broken, had no future, no hope of recovery, and no chance of a better life. She was completely reliant on nurses like Beth to keep her alive, and this is how she'd live until she expired. It was a miserable existence, somehow worse than the one Beth herself had lived through. In that moment, Beth said she remembered thinking that God had placed her inside Clotilda's room. 
She thought that he had given the poor woman more struggle than she could bear, and it had broken her. God was ready for her life to be over, and Beth felt that he had chosen her to be the person to send Clotilda home. Fully aware of what she was doing, Beth then increased the dosage on the insulin pen to what she hoped would be a lethal amount, 25 units, before plunging the needle into Clotilda's skin. She then exited the room, returned to the nurse's station, and waited. Several minutes later, another staff member entered Clotilda's room to check on her. This is when they noticed that her vitals were dropping rapidly. They called for assistance, and after some quick work, the on-call doctor was able to determine that she was in hypoglycemic shock. The staff's vigilance and quick thinking saved Clotilda's life that night. However, Beth was not finished. Aren't they going to investigate how she entered hyperglycemic shock? Because that seems like something an overdose of insulin would do. Over the next few hellacious weeks inside Carisant, Beth continued to experiment by giving Clotilda's sister, who was also a patient under her care, various higher doses of insulin to watch for changes in her behavior. Neither sister was killed by Beth, but they both had emergencies that needed to be addressed and may have suffered further complications because of this experimentation. Why are you doing this? That's really different. From like, oh, I'm putting her out of her misery, which I'm not saying is right in any way whatsoever. But then it's like, and she, now she's just like, oh, let's see what happens if I give old people loads of insulin. Maybe they'll die, maybe they won't. That's a whole lot fucking darker. Isn't it? Three months later, however, Beth would claim her first life. On August the 11th, 2007, 84-year-old World War II veteran James Silcox was wandering the halls of Caresson looking for his wife Agnes. James had just been transferred there after suffering a stroke, and he was confused, lost, and scared. Unfortunately, he was also in the care of Beth Wettlaufer, who had lost all patience with him. After guiding James back to his room at 9.30 p.m., Beth pulled out an insulin syringe that she'd stolen from the facility's medical supply room. She injected him with approximately 50 units of fast-acting insulin. This was, if you recall, twice as much as she had injected into Clotilda just a few months earlier. Then she exited the room and waited anxiously for the inevitable to happen. Wait, James is not… he's like… Uh, sure, he's 84 years old and he's had a stroke, but… People recover from strokes. I mean, even at 84, that doesn't necessarily mean it's all over. A short time later, as the old grizzled veteran lay in bed, his glucose level began to drop dangerously low to the point that he lost consciousness. He never knew what happened to him, and the next morning, he was pronounced dead. As the nurse in charge of nights, Beth was responsible for documenting anything suspicious or out of the ordinary about her patient's death that may warrant an additional investigation. She, of course, did not. And because deaths inside elder care facilities are an extremely common occurrence, no autopsy was performed. James was laid to rest several days later by his family, who were completely unaware that anything had happened. They assumed that his unexpected death had been a delayed complication from the stroke. Only Beth knew the truth, and on December the 23rd, 2007, she would kill again. This time, Beth took the life of 84-year-old Maurice Graner, an elderly cancer patient who had a known habit of grabbing his nurse's breasts while they were interacting with him. According to Beth, she injected Maurice with insulin that afternoon because he was a similar state to the one that James Silcox had been in, confused and angry. No chance of recovery. Wait, who's making that decision? With no chance of recovery? Like, it doesn't seem like there's no chance of recovery. However, the fact that Maurice had grabbed Beth's breast earlier that afternoon had caused many people, including me, to wonder how much of her decision was based around mercy and how much of it stemmed from a desire for revenge. Or just stemmed from the fact that she's a psycho. James was pronounced dead the following morning, on Christmas Eve. True love. At the same time that Beth was murdering those under her care by night, she and Sheila were continuing their online relationship by day. Sheila's mother was sick and living in a care facility like the one that Beth worked in, so talking about the struggles of older people gave them something to bond over. Soon they began making plans to meet in person. In 2008, Beth boarded a plane and flew to Prince Albert for a week-long passion-filled visit. By then, she was finally coming to terms with her sexuality, as she was eager to spend some time away from home so that she could experience what it was like to live out of the closet. According to Sheila, Beth stepped out of the plane wearing bold red lipstick and dressed in a bright sundress, ran right up to her, and began hugging and kissing her and hanging all over her. She then threw her arms around Sheila's neck and informed her that even though this was their first time meeting one another in person, she already knew that they were going to be together forever. It was love at first sight, Beth said, and as soon as Sheila was ready, she could fly back home, pick up her things so they could start their life together. She was so sure of their love that she had already announced to her co-workers that they were going to be married soon. This feels quite borderline, doesn't it? As you can imagine, all of this happening in the middle of an airport terminal caused quite a scene, and the attention made Sheila very uncomfortable. She made Beth aware of this, but Beth was undeterred, and the love bombing did not stop. Sheila helped Beth carry her luggage, trying to force a smile, but the whole interaction had soured her mood, and she had a bad feeling that things were only going to get worse. 
That night, as the pair shared their first dinner together, Sheila's fears were confirmed when Beth continued to hang all over her like a teenager on her first date. She refused to settle down, and when Sheila told her again that she was uncomfortable, Beth became agitated. When describing their time together in a later interview, Sheila said, She pouted a lot and had little temper tantrums, you know, like if she didn't get something her own way, like my affection and stuff like that. There were a lot of childish issues with her, and I just thought, you're a grown woman. Act like it. After dinner, when it was time for Sheila to drive Beth to her home, she changed her mind and decided to take them to a hotel instead, not wanting to show Beth where she lived. <laughs> Uh-oh. They sat up talking together throughout the night, which made Beth happy. However, after spending less than 24 hours with their long-time, long-distance girlfriend, Sheila had already decided that they were not a good fit. She decided that they would spend the remainder of the week together as planned, but after that, it was over. After that night, she began looking for an opportunity to let Beth down as gently as she could as she tried to deal with her increasingly strange behaviors as they presented themselves. At one point during this week, Sheila brought Beth to the hospital where her ill mother was being treated, assuming that, because they had spoken about her so often during their online interactions, Beth would want to meet her. However, as soon as they were introduced, Beth's mood shifted dramatically. Sheila said that Beth took a seat in the corner of the room and pouted until they left. As they were exiting the hospital following this awkward interaction, Beth told her that she didn't want to visit that hospital again during her visit because Sheila's mother's condition made her uncomfortable. Sheila thought that considering Beth was a nurse herself, this was extremely odd behavior, but she did not press the issue. They then drove back to the hotel room and attempted to put the day behind them. On the final day of Beth's visit, Sheila revealed how she felt. She told Beth that it wasn't going to work because they were simply a bad fit. She was thankful for her friendship during such a difficult time, but friends were all they would ever be. Beth returned home in tears, feeling alone and very angry. Death everywhere. Although Beth's time with Sheila had been bittersweet, it did encourage her to finally accept who she really was, and when she returned to Woodstock, she did so with a new outlook on life. Her time in the closet was officially over, and she was ready to experience all the things that she'd missed throughout her life. Eventually, after dating around a bit, she met and moved in with another local woman from Woodstock, and the pair quickly got engaged, likely at Beth's request. Upon learning that Beth had moved in with another woman, her parents, Doug and Hazel, chose to simply refer to Beth's fiancé as her mentally disabled roommate. What the f*** are you up to? <laughs> Why not just say her roommate? Why do you have to say she's mentally disabled? What the f***? They said that Beth had rented out her spare room to someone in need and purposefully never acknowledged what was happening right in front of them. This cold interaction was the closest thing to acceptance that Beth would ever receive from them. <laughs> what the fuck? Like the past. Over the next few years, despite her personal development, Beth continued to abuse drugs and alcohol regularly, and although she had gotten quite good at being a functional alcoholic, there were a few notable slip-ups. On more than one occasion, other nurses discovered Beth passed out in Caress and Care's basement, high out of her mind and unintelligible. <laughs> When I imagine her going down there, I just imagine her catching a little buzz. But she's so high that she can't even talk. Holy sh**. She was slumped over, barely breathing, and obviously in need of immediate medical aid. Somehow, Beth was able to play these incidents off as severe panic attacks, fainting spells, and other medical emergencies that were hard to disprove. Most people accepted her explanations for these events, and she was never disciplined for them. However, she was placed on administrative leave several times for medication-related errors. These leaves were usually short and only lasted long enough for basic internal investigations to occur, none of which resulted in any further disciplinary action. This was unfortunate, because throughout her entire time at Caress and Care, Beth continued to claim lives. Between 2007 and 2011, she took the lives of 87-year-old Gladys Millard, 95-year-old Helen Matheson, 96-year-old Mary Zawinski, all of whom were suffering from various illnesses but were still very much alive. She also attempted to murder multiple others, including 63-year-old Michael Priddle, who suffered from Huntington's disease, and 57-year-old Wayne Hedges, a schizophrenic man who had trouble leading a normal life, even with the aid of medication. Yeah, but he's not dying. He's a 57-year-old schizophrenic. Both men were housed at Caressant, both were injected with insulin, and both only survived because other staff members stepped in and rescued them once it became clear that something wasn't right. After these failures, something changed in Beth. She began to question if her actions were morally wrong. As strange as it seems, up to this point, she still genuinely believed that murdering her patients was the right thing to do because she believed that killing them was an act of mercy. What the f***? Like, this isn't your decision to make. She claimed that killing them felt like freeing them, but it also felt like freeing herself. Which is very concerning. Like, I can vaguely understand. Like, I don't know how I feel about, um, uh, what's it called? Euthanasia. But... I'm probably like, yes, people should be able to choose to die, but it should be their decision. 
and the person who is conducting the euthanasia, if they feel any sort of like, oh, yeah, this feels good, they should not be doing that job. Holy sh**. In some twisted way, she was using them as surrogates for herself, and seeing them pass into the afterlife brought her some amount of relief. Realizing this, starting around 2010, Beth's mindset about the killings began to change. After each murder, she claims to have fallen into a deep depression but couldn't understand why. She began to feel immense guilt for her actions, but also claimed that she couldn't stop herself from killing. Why exactly, she wasn't sure, but she said that when she saw someone who needed to be killed, a red wave would wash over her, drowning out all reason and rational thought. It wasn't until she'd killed that this wave would dissipate, leaving her body tingling and shaking in a way that she likened to an intense full-body orgasm. Bruh. When Beth realized what she was doing was wrong, she made a conscious effort to stop murdering, and this worked out for two full years, during which time she did not inject any more of her patients. However, eventually the red wave returned, and Beth claimed that she was powerless to stand against it. On July 13, 2013, a new patient, 90-year-old Helen Young, arrived at Caressant and was placed in Beth's care. Unfortunately, like James Silcox many years before, Helen was suffering from advanced dementia and did not know who or where she was, who Beth was, or what was happening to her. She would call out for help at all hours of the night, panicked by her own unfortunate confusion, awaking other residents and creating more work for Beth and her co-workers in the process. Aggravated and unable to resist the red wave any longer, Beth then entered Helen's room and injected her with multiple insulin pens, giving her more than ten times the amount of insulin she normally required. Over the next few hours, as the night went on, Helen began to fade. But because of the amount of insulin she had been given, it was not a painless experience. She suffered as her face turned bright red, her eyes bulged, and her limbs stiffened. It was a truly horrible way to die. The next morning, when Helen's niece arrived at Caressant after receiving the news of her aunt's death, Beth found her crying and began comforting her, telling her that everything was going to be all right. That Helen was in a better place. She put a hand on the woman's shoulder, pulling her in for a large, comforting bear hug, and she cried with her. Later that morning, as Beth filled out the paperwork for Helen's death, she began to laugh, a deep and uncomfortable laugh that she later stated was a cackling from the pits of hell. She wasn't laughing because she thought it was funny. She was laughing because she couldn't help it. It was like an uncomfortable spasm happening deep in her belly. She once again felt horrible for what she'd done, but was powerless to stop it. She had lost all control of herself. One year later, she murdered 79-year-old Maureen Pickering in a similar manner. However, this would be her last murder at Caressant Care. Exposed. As a direct result of Maureen Pickering's death in 2014, Beth's supervisors opened an investigation into her conduct. They determined that, based on her track record of bizarre behavior and the multiple suspensions she had received for medical-related errors, Beth's employment should be terminated immediately. It's not clear what they knew or suspected about her, but they then filed a report with the Canadian government, but no action was taken. Beth's nursing license was not suspended or revoked. Now having lost her job, Beth set out to find new employment, and she eventually landed at Meadow Park Nursing Home in Ontario in August 2014. Here she claimed yet another life, that of 75-year-old Arpad Horvath Sr. Arpad was suffering from dementia when he met Beth that year. He couldn't understand what he was doing, but he would often become violent with his caretakers, hitting and kicking them as they tried to care for him. He would also make sexually suggestive remarks while doing so. Beth quickly decided that it was time for Arpad to go to heaven. She killed him as she had done with all the others, a high dose of insulin, which caused a painful death. After this latest murder, Beth's mental state completely collapsed, and she resigned from her position at Meadow Park, saying that she was unfit to work due to her addiction to prescription pain pills. The real reason, however, is that she was angry with herself for letting the red wave win. The following week, she checked herself into a drug rehabilitation clinic in Ontario, where she spent approximately one month getting clean. When Beth was finally released from this facility, sometime either around 2014 or 2015, she found herself at one of the lowest points in her life. She had lost everything important to her, including her fiancé, and had very little to live for. Still needing to earn money, however, Beth then found work as a home health nurse who traveled to patients' homes to administer basic care. These people, her new patients, lived independently because they were still relatively healthy and capable of caring for themselves. They only needed help with some more strenuous and complicated tasks, such as bathing, self-grooming, and organizing the medication, but they were still largely capable of moving around, cooking for themselves, and handling most of their own affairs without aid. These were not people who were suffering on death's door, as many of Beth's other victims had been. Yet she targeted them just the same. In August of 2016, 68-year-old Beverly Bertram, who only needed periodic assistance while healing from a recent leg injury, welcomed Beth into her home, grateful to have help administering her antibiotics via an IV. She trusted Beth, but on the 21st of August that year, Beth injected her with insulin, 
that she had stolen from another one of her patients. She gave her 180 units. Thankfully, because Beverly was mostly healthy. Yeah, she's only 68! Like, my parents are not that far off 68. She only suffered a nasty headache and an intense bout of nausea before waking up the following morning completely fine. She could have easily died, which was obviously Beth's goal, but like the rest of the victims in today's episode, she had no idea what happened to her. Following this failed attempted murder, Beth resigned from her position as a home health nurse when she discovered that she was to be charged with caring for her diabetic children who required regular insulin doses. She was not willing to give herself the opportunity to be around children because, although she had never killed a child before, she would not be able to control herself if the red wave returned. One month later, on September 16, 2016, she once again checked herself into another drug rehabilitation program at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto. This is where she would confess her crimes to her counselor, who would then call the police, leaving us where our episode began. Some much needed reform. On June 16, 2017, Elizabeth Wetlafer was given eight life sentences to be served concurrently after confessing and pleading guilty to eight separate counts of murder in the first degree and four counts of aggravated assault committed against people in her care. In the wake of Beth's shocking confession, one of the biggest questions in everyone's minds was how she'd gotten away with everything for so long. And people were pretty pissed. The people that Beth had murdered were helpless. Most were completely unable to care for themselves, and the fact that something like this had happened under everyone's noses was both disheartening and infuriating. Arpad Horvath Jr., the son of one of Beth's last victims, said, I want to see the healthcare system revamped, nursing care, senior care, but mostly I want to see the people who are accountable crucified in the public eye, online, and everywhere. So, who exactly is to blame for Beth killing so many people? I don't know, maybe fucking Beth? Well, obviously, Beth herself is responsible, but as more details came out in the days and weeks that followed her confession, the public's anger with people around her only grew. If you recall, I mentioned earlier in the episode that Beth had been placed on administrative leave four separate times during her seven years working within caressant care for medical-related errors. But I didn't tell you why she was never fired for those errors. Allegedly, according to sources within the facility, the managers at Caressant had not maintained a comprehensive list of Beth's disciplinary records. So over the course of her seven-year employment, those in charge of determining how to punish her were not aware of all of her past offenses. Whoa! That's something you should really be keeping track of. Like, just stick it in a cupboard. It's not that hard. When determining what action should be taken against her, they viewed each offense as if it was the first. Additionally, despite being fired, Caressant also provided Beth with a $2,000 settlement and a letter of recommendation that allowed her to say that she resigned from her position instead of being terminated. Why? This was done, a spokesman for the facility said, to prevent the nurses' union from filing a lawsuit against them on Beth's behalf. That is mega f***ed up. What the f***? Like, you can't be making a letter of recommendation for someone who you can't recommend. Then, making matters even worse, it was learned that Beth had disclosed her crimes to several people throughout her life, including her former pastor, one of her former lawyers, and several of her friends, all of whom had either not taken her seriously or had urged her to keep quiet to avoid being sent to prison. The f <laughs> her former pastor, whose name is not available online as far as I'm aware, said that Beth had proven herself to be a liar and an attention seeker during the short time that he'd known her, so he assumed that her lady's confession was just another fabrication for attention. Had he believed her, he said, he would have certainly called the police. In response to this controversy, the Canadian government launched an internal investigation that determined there were systematic vulnerabilities within Canada's elder care system that claimed that many of those issues were difficult to, difficult to solve. After reviewing over 40,000 documents throughout a year-long investigation, they released their findings, which blamed a lack of funding for elder care facilities, understaffing, overpopulation, growing hostilities against healthcare workers, and all the other usual suspects. They also noted that there was no system in place to track insulin the way opioids were tracked. These were all massive problems that affected the majority of the healthcare system, but the government knew they needed to provide specifics for how and why Beth herself had not been caught. According to them, if she had not confessed, she would have likely never been caught. So settle in for a moment as I tell you what I've learned about insulin homicide. Okay then. In addition to the reasons that we've already discussed, Beth being in a position of power with incarescent care and killing during the night when no one else around, she had also chosen a very difficult to detect method of murder. As many forensic investigators are aware, insulin makes for a powerful and effective weapon as it's very difficult to distinguish natural insulin from synthetic insulin during a standard post-mortem examination. Special tests are needed and the data collected from those tests requires non-standard data analysis to be performed to effectively interpret the results. These tests are very expensive, time-consuming, and require medical examiners to collect and review the person's insulin history, including checking for a history of insulin abuse or misuse. Who's abusing insulin? What's, what recreational or beneficial effect does insulin have for, like, abuse? 
so they are rarely performed when foul play is not already suspected. Essentially, if a coroner is not specifically looking for homicide via insulin overdose, they will not find it. And even if they are, the chances are still slim. One of the few ways that insulin overdose can be detected is by locating pockets of unevenly distributed insulin across the body that would not be present if the insulin had been produced as a result of natural endogenous process. Endogenous? The problem with this is that the investigators must be searching for these pockets, as they're also difficult to detect. The usual way they're found is by searching for the presence of a needle track mark somewhere on the victim's body. This is usually where those pockets of insulin will remain after death, in some cases of insulin overdose. However, for an elderly person who's already taking insulin, the presence of these marks and others is expected and unremarkable. Additionally, making matters even more complicated, elderly people are already prone to sudden drops in blood sugar and undocumented hypoglycemia is a common issue. This makes homicide by insulin even more difficult to detect because Beth only targeted elderly patients, most of whom were frail and plagued with comorbidities. So overall, the results of this investigation basically stated Beth had gotten away with it because insulin homicide is very easy to get away with not a very insightful outcome. However, the Canadian government also stated that the purpose of the inquiry had been to rebuild the public's trust through transparency, and in 2019, they released a list of 91 recommendations to help people protect elders housed in elder care facilities from people like Beth. These included keeping track of insulin supplies, limiting the number of temp nurses on call, and raising the public's awareness of insulin homicide and the potential for elder abuse. However, they also stated, there is no simple fix in terms of avoiding similar tragedies in the future. <laughs> It's a terrifying thing to say, isn't it? Today, Elizabeth Wetlaffer is housed inside the Grand Valley Institution for Women in Kitchener, Ontario. She will be eligible for parole in 2042, when she'll be 75 years old. And that's where we end today's episode. Thank you for being here. If you enjoy the show, I mean, it's a show about a woman who killed loads of people, so I won't say enjoy, but if you find the show interesting, why not leave it a rating on Spotify? That would be fantastic. Or if you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe. And I'll see you next time. Just before you go today, don't forget this video is brought to you by Holskin. You can get a 15% discount on their amazing products at holskin.com forward slash the casual criminalist. Promo code casual15. Thanks to them for sponsoring, and thank you for watching.